Okay, first of all, before I get um, too much into this video, I want to first of all uh, clarify that this is definitely a programming video and not one really related too much to EVE Online, although the problem that I encountered um, came about because I was writing a tool to use with this game, and I wanted to kind of explain how the problem came about. Um, and what this video will actually be about is picking midpoints with a binary search and how you might run into trouble when trying to do that. Um, so this is EVE Online, and it's a, a spaceship simulation game. It's it's really kind of in a genre of its own. Um, but basically, you can see I'm in this star system, and uh, the solar systems in the game are fairly big, as you might expect. And actually, I can't see any of these ships that are in the system because they're too far away. And in order to help you locate ships in-game, the game gives you this tool, and you can see it in this window down here in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. This is called your directional scanner. And it has a maximum range of 14 astronomical units. And what you can do is you can set this to the max range and then click scan. And you can see that there are actually a few ships, uh, three retrievers and one procurer, within 14 astronomical units of my ship right now. But if you'll notice, they actually don't give me the distance that I am from these ships. So even though I can see that there are ships within that range, I can't actually figure out where they are exactly. So the usual advice that's given to players whenever this situation happens is to use a binary search by changing the range in your uh, directional scanner. And we can go ahead and tr truncate the um, 14 AU to just 14 for simplicity and pick our first midpoint, which in the standard binary search would be 7. So you can go ahead and scan at 7 AU, and we see that all of the retrievers disappeared, which means that they are going to be further away than 7 astronomical units. So our next midpoint will be the midpoint between 7 and 14, which is 10.5, and we can see that one retriever has now reappeared on our scan. And then we can keep doing this. We'll, you know, we'll make it simple. We'll just drop it down to say 8 AU. This is kind of like the rough estimate that you might do whenever you're actually playing the game. Bring it back up to 9. So it's, now we know it's more than 9 and less than 10. 9.5. Um, and then let's try like 9.75. And we see, okay, it's between 9.5 and 9.75. And I can see that planet 7 is actually, if you look here, planet 7 is... Uh, 9.7 AU away. And since this, this is a mining ship, we'll expect them to be in an asteroid belt. So we'll go to asteroid belt at, let's see, planet 8, I think, uh, asteroid belt 2. I've actually already scouted this guy out, so I know where he is. Um, so I'll fly over there just to kind of confirm that he's there. Uh, but basically, this is how you would do it. Um, but in an older version of the game, you actually didn't have this nice AU uh, range right here. You actually had to type in the range completely. It looks like he's he's actually left, so that makes or actually um, well let's just let's try to find him here real quick, just to to show that it actually works. Okay, so he's not in belt two. Let's check in belt one. Uh, all the oh, asteroid belts are clustered really close together, but he's definitely within one AU, so we're on the right track here. Um, but anyways. Uh, in, the, in an older version of the game, you actually had to do the math using this kilometer tool, which you can see at 14 AU, 14.3 AU is is quite a bit. It looks like it's over 2 billion uh, kilometers, and you have to end up doing the binary search using that. Let's see, he's not here. This built either. Uh, this guy's really trolling me. Um, and that was that was really difficult, and and it was prone to error, and. If you had a tool to help you simplify this and help you kind of locate ships more quickly, you could actually, okay, and then finally I found this guy, here he is. Um, you could actually locate, for instance, in this case I've had to work around a different belt, but um, you could actually use the tool to go ahead and help you locate things much more quickly to like the exact kilometer that they're at, so I would know exactly which asteroid belt he was in. But anyways, here he is mining. Okay, so before we get into too much of the nitty-gritty about um, picking midpoints and why this particular approach is no good, uh, I wanted to show the actual tool that I made in order to help the directional scanning sort of like process of elimination that we just went through in-game. Um, and basically it looks like this, and I, I never release this to the public, which explains why it doesn't really look all that great, but the basic idea is that we had a, um, a ship that we were looking for, and we had a, our initial span, like the initial range that we had was 14.3 um, AU. 
and we saw that we had a ship on scan and we immediately split the range in half. This is automatically generated at the test point. This is um, halfway through the range, about 7 AU. We can actually copy this into the converter at the top in order to determine that that's actually the case. So yeah, it's about 7 AU. And um, initially when we click scan, the retriever disappeared. It actually it disappeared off scan. So we had what we what I call a miss. You know, we clicked descan and the ship didn't show up on scan, so it missed. And you can see that eliminates this inner circle, right? And so then we, we got a new midpoint and we tested that out. And whenever we tested that out, we actually, we got a hit. And that process kind of um, continued on. I don't remember exactly how it went, but we weren't using the exact midpoints anyway. But you can see that with each, you know, hit or miss, we actually um, narrow down the range more and more until we're in this like very narrow band. And then we can kind of use some simple process of elimination to figure out where the ship is um, due to the kind of the way that the game mechanics and Eve work, which is really beyond the scope of this video. Um, but that's basically, you know, the, the general idea. There's this very basic tool um, to use. Okay, so I have some slides here, and they're fairly old and um, not really intended to be about the same thing that I'm talking about here, but I think they'll um, do pretty well. I did put, you know, a bit of effort into them, so I'll go ahead and try to make use of them here. Um, this is sort of, this slide is kind of talking about how to perform a binary search. The main thing that we're interested in right here, though, is the, um, the midpoint formula, which is given right here. And this is a formula that we use sort of, like we use in our binary search, but probably without really thinking about it too much. This is actually a particular formula that you could potentially, if you wanted to, and just keep this in mind, you could potentially pull it out of the algorithm and, you know, have it be customizable such that, you know, a, a person could pass in their own algorithm to determine the splitting of our, uh, of our data set. But currently we just use the midpoint formula. This is basically what most people will use whenever they're doing the binary search. And uh, the slide here just gives you an example of guessing the number between 1 and 100, which I think is like, that's a pretty standard example. And then, of course, you know, you repeat the algorithm until you find a solution. Um, and then this talks more about, I guess, the, the game. Okay, and then here we go. Here's the math, and this is kind of where the, the rub comes in. Uh, whenever we're searching through... Here we go. Okay, whenever we're searching um, for a target in EVE Online, you have to keep in mind that this is a three-dimensional game, and you have to think about the directional scanner and the search space that it actually spans. Okay, whenever we change the radius on our on our um, directional scanner, we're actually determining the size of a sphere that will be scanned out. Anything within a certain distance, you know, a distance x of our ship will appear or not appear on the directional scanner. But what we're actually doing, you know, is we're, we're checking everything within like this volume of space. It's a sphere that we're scanning out, and that's what's really important here. And if we look at the uh, formula for a volume of a sphere, we see that it's 4 pi r cubed divided by 3, and that actually equals our volume. So whenever we change our radius, our volume changes, but it's not in a linear way. Okay, it's not like, this is not a linear equation because we have this cube term over here. You know, we can factor out all of the constants. We can factor out the four, four pi thirds, and then we just have, you know, we ha we're left with this r cubed. So this is actually a cubic equation. So down here, we have an example of a run-through. So for 5 AU, what is the volume? Like, what volume do we have at a 5 AU scan? Well, if you do the math and you work it out, it turns out that, you know, we've got about 523 AU cubed. Okay, we have 523 AU cubed at 5 AU. But whenever we increase our scan range to 10 AU, you know, you would expect, I mean, you might not expect if you if you remember this kind of thing from high school math or maybe even middle school math, to be honest. But, you know, a lot of people will assume that if you double the radius, then you're doubling your search area. But this actually isn't true at all. Because see, whenever we actually plug in 10 AU to our formula, we see that we actually get over 4,000 AU cubed. So the ratio, like down here at the bottom, the ratio of a sphere with 5 AU radius to a sphere with a 10 AU radius is actually 1 to 8. So we're not really, if we're using just a straight up binary search on the radius of the sphere, it's not even giving us close to the correct midpoint. We are way, way off. And then uh, I guess this is just a text explanation of that, of what I just said. 
Oh, and then uh, this this will actually tell you, you know, all you have to do is you solve for R. So you go through the steps, you know, you solve for R, and then you can actually come up with this formula, and this will be a much better formula for picking the midpoint. You can actually use this instead of the midpoint formula to get the act to actually have the volume that you're searching for, and that's that'll give you the behavior of the binary algorithm that we're looking for. Okay, and then uh, very quickly here, this is actually a graph, and uh, and on this graph, um. I actually have, if you see the x and the y axis, both at the same range here. So, and this is um this is a graph of a circle. This is actually not even the sphere case because that was a little bit too extreme. But in the two dimensional case, where we say our directional scan is actually sweeping out a circle instead of a sphere, and actually in the game this is a pretty common case. You know the the systems are typically like on a plane. You know all the planets and the systems on in Eve Online are on a plane. And uh, so oftentimes you'll just want to actually look at the circular case instead of the entire sphere just to make it a little bit easier on yourself, give you less space to search through. But this is the actual graph of the, um, the radius along the x-axis. This is the radius. And uh, this is how the area changes. And as you can see, the area grows dramatically compared to the radius. So clearly we can't just use a standard binary search and get good results because the area is growing so rapidly compared to the radius. Okay, so I've talked a lot about um, the problems that I had with this tool that I wrote for this game, and a lot of people may be, you know, falling asleep to, to talk about all that nonsense. You know, it's like, well, who cares? You know, you may not care about that type of stuff. So let's use a little bit of a more familiar example. Um, this is a normal curve, and this is an image I found online, and it talks about the SAT scores, where they say the mean is about 1,500. We're going to go ahead and round whenever I talk about this, just for simplicity. Uh, but the mean is about 1,500, and the standard deviation is about 300, and the scores fall along this uh, this curve. So if we wanted to find, say, somebody who got a score of, let's just say, for the sake of argument, you know, 1,700 here, uh, the first thing we'd want to do is we'd want to take, like, the midpoint of this range. And you can see that, you know, it, it gives a range in this picture of 500 to 2,500. Uh, but the you know we'll just take the medium as a starting point. You know that's a good starting point. And that's that'll give us um, a nice symmetry. You know there's this, this nice symmetry to the curve. And if we take the the mean, then we just have we'll have fifty percent on one side and fifty percent on the other. So you know that'll work out well for us. So if we had the first split at a you know right in the middle of the bell curve, you know we can go to a, a calculator here. I've pulled one up already, and I've already put in the mean as fifteen hundred and the standard deviation as three hundred. We can see that all the scores above fifteen hundred are about 50% right here. We see that the um, the area is, you know, 0.5, so this equates to about 15% or 50%. And uh, the same thing below, obviously. The other half of the scores, you know, will be there as well. So after our first step of the binary curve, we'll eliminate the lower half of this curve. We'll eliminate 50% of the potential candidates. But we're looking for students who have scored 1,700. So now we just have this upper half of the curve. We've got the... Um, the upper half over here, and if we use our normal midpoint formula based on the scores that students are receiving, we actually come up with a midpoint of 1950. I've already done this calculation, so I'm just letting you know it's 1950. So now if we look at scores that are above 1950, we see that only 6.6% .6 of the entire student population falls in this area. Now. We've already eliminated half of the students, you know, we know that those are not potential candidates and we're only looking at half of the area here. So you can actually double this and you end up getting about 13%. But as you can see, if we pick this midpoint, 13% of the students are going to be above that score. And then let's, let's see, okay, so below 1950, or actually we need between, sorry about this, I should have done this ahead of time, but 1500 and 1950. We have 43% um, of the students are about, you know, for the remaining area that we have, um, we're going to have about 86% of the students below that score. So as you can see, if we, if we try to use the midpoint formula with a normal distribution, so whenever our data is normally distributed, we're actually not getting correct results at all. Actually, our second split is going to be awful almost every single time. I mean, we may as well just use a random split point. I mean, really, it's no good at all. And so this is a major problem, I think, you know, whenever you're actually doing a binary search, you need to consider the underlying distribution of your data. If it's completely uniformly random, then that's great, you know, the binary search will work great. But otherwise, I think you need to come up with some sort of like, well, or at least you should consider coming up with some sort of alternative to 
the straight up midpoint formula. Either you need to normalize your data, like I believe that there are ways that you can actually, are, well I say normalize, that's a very confusing term, but you need to transform your data such that it has a uniform distribution, or you need to come up with some way to calculate a midpoint that would make more sense. So like for in this case, you know, we might be able to come up with a formula that would calculate a more sensible um, midpoint for the normal distribution. Because otherwise you're just going to end up having, you know, bad midpoints. But I was looking into this topic, okay, I was looking into this topic and I actually, you know, a lot of the, I mean, it was really difficult to actually find any information on it. So I'm going to, you know, look into it some more and maybe see if I can come up with any more insightful you know, like um, solutions to the problem. But really, a lot of people say that the binary search is quick enough, even in these situations. You know, whenever there are these weird situations where you've got weird distributions, sometimes it's, you know, it's enough just to let the binary search do its thing. And even if it's not optimal, it's still way better than, you know, for instance, a linear search. And so I think a lot of times people will just kind of shrug off this problem. Still, though, you know, I mean, it's it's not even really about the optimization of it. It's about uh, being correct and having a good understanding of the algorithm, you know. So I think in the future I'm going to do a little bit more research on this topic and maybe come back and make another um, another video or, you know, another article or something that kind of explains any insights that I've gained since then and maybe does performance benchmarks to determine if it's even worth uh, you know, finding better midpoints or transforming your data and, and just trying to see about the situations in which it does and does not matter. Um, but anyways, you know, this, like I said, this is a work in progress, so I'm sorry if you came to the video hoping to find all of the answers, but this is uh, a problem that I came across, so I just, I wanted to kind of like illustrate, um, you know, why, why it might happen and when it might be useful to know this sort of stuff.